We left off um, last time talking about the nature of cities, the definition of a city, and perhaps um, uh, more importantly, my own definition. Uh, and forgive me, I am, came down with a very bad cold, so I am in the ozone here today, a little spacey um, from this medication that I'm taking. Um, and we left off um, with this slide, talking about density. Now, density, if you recall Kostov's um, statement that it's, uh, cities are where a certain energized crowding takes place, and while I think that's true, uh, certainly midtown Manhattan is more energized and more crowded than um, you know, a rural area, let's say, in South Carolina. But, um, but that's insufficient, I think, uh, simply as a definition of a city. So he gives us eight more. However, density is important, and it is deceptively, like a lot of things, it is deceptively difficult to measure density. Normally, when people uh, talk about density, they're talking about population density. Uh, but that is not the only kind of density that needs to be measured. Uh, the number of people per unit of land, per hectare, per acre, per square mile, per something. And sometimes by looking at cities that way, we can uh, learn something very interesting, such that Paris, France, for example, inside the peripherique, has a population density of 108 people per acre. That is a lot of people. In fact, uh, it's second only to Hong Kong as one of the most densely populated cities in the world and actually is double the population density of Manhattan, even though the majority of the buildings in Paris are no more than six stories. So population density alone is actually not, um, it can be a deceptive measure. Um, often, particularly in the planning world, in the city planning profession, uh, in fact, zoning ordinances tend to deal with density as the number of dwelling units per unit of land. So if you picked up a zoning ordinance for DeKalb County, Georgia, or for Aurora, Colorado, or wherever in the United States, uh, you would have categories of land use in the residential category that would be based upon how many units, how many dwelling units you were allowed to build in any of those zoning categories um, per acre. Um, that is... Um, um, Incomplete. In fact, I would argue that it's one of the worst um, measures of density that we could possibly use because it sort of assumes for any long-range planning uh, that cities are, are constant. What we know is that they change over time. We know that this was a Chevrolet dealership and that was Fan and Bill's restaurant and this was a parking lot and single-family residential. Peachtree Street began its life 100 years ago all up and down Peachtree Street, all the way from downtown to Buckhead, was in fact single-family residential, 90% of it. Uh, and it changed. It converted to office, institutional, and other kinds of uses over time. So if we look only at dwelling units per acre or per hectare per unit of land, um, we, we are missing um, uh, a lot. Now, why then does it gain such popularity in the regulatory environment of city planning. And I think it's, uh, the answer is obvious, that it becomes a system, a medium of exchange. A real estate developer wants 12 dwelling units per acre. The neighborhood wants six dwelling units per acre, et cetera. And so you wind up then being able to compromise. So it has a certain kind of exchange value. But in terms of measuring something over the long haul, um, a future that we can't control and it may unfold after we are gone, measuring density uh, by dwelling units is deceptive. It doesn't do us much good. Um, the other would be the size of the lot or the parcel really as an extension of number two. Often these are expressed as quarter acre lot, eighth acre lot, acre lots, etc. And this again is part of that medium of exchange. Another whole category of density uh, are measures that are based upon uh, the constitutional frame, what was on the left side of the screen in the last lecture. And that would be the number of intersections per unit of land or the number of blocks per unit of land. 
because of the permanence, the relative permanence of the constitutional order, um, I think it's important for the long term to measure density in terms of the number of intersections that we have per unit of land. When Savannah, Georgia is laid out in 1733 and 34, um, everything is single family, uh, single families we'll see, single family lots, all the tithing lots, single family. Um, well, downtown Savannah is no longer single family, but it still has the same number of intersections, five intersections um, on the streets that are in fact running perpendicular to the river every 675 feet. And that's important because it means that you can actually then allow for land use change to occur over time without having to rip out the infrastructure. So that is a fairly important measure of density. Um, however, um, the, like all of these, these can be uh, somewhat difficult in sort of trying to determine uh, how you measure this. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, we just will take a square mile, or we'll take a square kilometer, and we will count the number uh, of intersections. And there are certain places, Maryland, for example, which has now started um, adopting these kinds, of, um, these kinds of measures. But how do you measure a block? It becomes, it becomes deceptively difficult. Uh, is it the, uh, the, the, the amount of acreage or uh, the number of hectares in a block? Is it the total length of the road or the street per unit of land before you get to an intersection? That is how subdivision regulations typically operate. You can go X number of feet without having uh, an intersection, but you cannot exceed that length without an intersection. Um, so we'll see in a moment uh, these are violated regularly. Um, block density. All streets at some point form blocks a block here being defined as a street that closes in on itself, right? A closed geometric figure. Um, so the number of blocks, obviously if you have blocks that are 200 feet by 200 feet, such as fairly popular in downtown Atlanta, or you have blocks that are 200 by 600 or 800 feet, as in Manhattan, you have a different kind of potential density and certainly a different kind of block density than you would, let's say, up here in Alpharetta in the Windward area that I showed uh, the other day. Uh, but blocks are difficult to measure because they're not all rectangles. Uh, some are actually trapezoids. Some are irregular sort of amoeba-shaped blocks. A, a lot of uh, residential areas here in Atlanta have these sort of amoeba-shaped blocks. So um, what becomes critical is understanding the relationship between block length and block depth, right? Block length and block depth. Um, the total perimeter, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to put this out there as saying that this is a deceptively difficult um, sort of measure uh, to come up with. Now, if we look at Atlanta and we look at the population density of Atlanta, what we see is this energized crowding that tends to develop here in the center and tends to follow uh, the major highways as they radiate out from that center. That is to be expected because proximity to uh, the roads become fairly critical things. This is a map then of population density in terms of the number of people per square mile. Uh, these vary substantially. Uh, just to take three examples, Atlanta, Chicago, and New York, we can see that um, within a mile of the center, uh, we have a very rapid drop-off here in New York and also in Chicago out to about 19 or 20 miles. And by the time we get 32 miles or 31 miles away from the center, Atlanta, Chicago, and New York are the same, even though they are still economically defined as being part of the standard metropolitan statistical area. Um, again, this is not something that's going to appear on a test. I just simply want to show you the, um, the um, different ways that density can be measured. Now, I got interested in this a, a number of years ago, and I began a little study which is sort of semi-scientific. I say semi because it's only a sample of 100, 10 cities, 10 blocks, uh, 200 actually, 10 cities, 10 blocks, um, 
On the left are blocks that were in cities built, parts of cities built before 1928, and on the right, parts of cities that were built after 1928. Why 1928? Because that is the year that the standard city planning enabling statute was passed out of Congress, and that is when we have subdivision regulations in a formal way coming in uh, in almost every city and every county, every municipal jurisdiction in the nation. Uh, so it seemed to be a sort of convenient watershed. So the question across a very large geographic territory in cities that range in age from 300 years to fairly new cities like Atlanta, um, no particular logic other than geographic distribution. Um, and then uh, we measured these simply using the number of acres in a block. And in the absence of regulation, I find this fascinating, in the absence of any formal regulation, this goes to the question that was asked in the back of the room yesterday, and I said I can't possibly answer that. Why is downtown Atlanta um, more sort of coherent in appearance, for example, when you look at it from the air than, let's say, uh, Alpharetta is? It's a complicated question, um, but this goes partway in explaining that. Um, that left simply to convention, to what people agreed upon, um, blocks actually were in a fairly tight pattern uh, with a small standard deviation of the average here of 0.79. That is incredibly small. After regulation, it went to 6.14 as a standard deviation. So here, the blocks after 1928, ironically, after we started regulating block size, uh, go all over the place. They're, they're, you can see the numbers. Um, I find that really interesting. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with this, but it needs to be expanded. I would like to look around the globe. I would like to expand the sample. Uh, right now it isn't, um, you know, 100 of these is not enough. And um, acreage, again, is probably not the only way to measure these things. But um, I find that fascinating. So the question is why? Now, the, the real question would be, well, then, if, if, if we move from agreement on how big a block should be prior to 1928, and we pass regulations in 1928 that regulate block size, why does the standard deviation go from less than 1 to 6.14? Yes? No, because I did it from Google Earth. I simply measured them. There's a little measuring tool in Google Earth, so it wouldn't have, it's just what are they, right? Um, it does have to do with automobiles, and it does have to do with something we will get to about three-fourths of the way through the course, which is um, uh, the American Association of Highway Transportation Officials and the classification of streets and how far you have to be between intersections to signal for a design speed of, let's say, 40 miles an hour, which is 1,800 feet. So if you have um, a parcel that is adjacent to a level one service, um, you can only signal at 1,800 feet. So that means um, there's no intervening intersection. If you square 1,800, it's 74.6 acres, so uh, 74.38 acres. So that, that in and of itself has to do then with this kind of peculiar, almost chemical <laughs> reaction um, between the standards that are set by transportation officials and, and then the, the subdivision regulations that control the subdivision of land, okay? Right. Um, so we, if we just look at maps of Paris, upper left, or Brasilia, a planned city, capital of Brazil on the upper right, Atlanta on the lower left, and Istanbul on the lower right, we can see simply in the pattern of streets, the density of of the, the black and gray colors, um, how these correlate then back to the density of blocks, the density of streets, the density of intersections, and the density of people. Well, streets, as I said, are the primary structural unit of the city, and as far as I know, there are only two types. Only two types. In the history of humankind, there are only two types. Uh, the one on the right is very old. It's called a dendritic system because it resembles, the pattern resembles tree roots, right? Dendrology, the study of trees. Uh, 
It also uh, resembles um, streams, the way streams, small streams become bigger streams, and eventually you get up to a fourth order stream like the Chattahoochee River or something like that. Um, the other is blocks. Now, this will at some point form a block, right? The difference is, is that there is no internal street other than perhaps an alley or a driveway or something else, which is actually a public right of way within the interior of the block. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to these. I have no idea why this is flickering. I think it has to do with perhaps me not recording this properly. Um, one of them is in terms of the visibility of public space. In a dendritic system, the public space, we will see this in Sana'a, medieval city in the Yemen, uh, and we saw this in Windward, where the public space is in effect, in effect behind um, the individual parcels. So it's on, in a sense, the private side of the parcel in the interstitial space, typically not visible from the public right-of-way, whereas uh, public space in a block structure, and again, blocks do not have to be rectangles. It's just easier for me to draw them that way. Um, the public space can be visible. So if the public space is to become the repository of a public building or of memory or of a monument or something like that, there's a certain advantage that blocks have over dendritic structures. They're also easier to add on to. It's very difficult once this pattern is set. It is very, very difficult to figure out how you add on to this. It has to sort of be done on the margins, and it's a very, very difficult thing. It also forms a pattern of infrastructure that is not conducive to changes in land use over time. The example I gave of this block that we are on here, like this, for example, um, without changing the streets, you could have tremendous change over time, over the last 50 years, um, in the use of these individual blocks, uh, from, a, from a restaurant to a parking deck, from, um, I guess now, a parking lot and a bank owned by Georgia Tech um, that used to be actually a car dealership. This, which used to be single family houses and a stereo repair shop where we are, which is ultimately now uh, the Scheller College of Business. Blocks are easy to add on to, right? Same reason in a sense that round cities are difficult to, to expand. Um, these are not orthogonal geometries are fairly easy to add on to on the margins. Now, if we look at just a few, um, a few of these, and I'll have to admit that this is a bit of a reaction to, um, I've taught a lot of students from overseas, and they will describe American cities being very different from European or Asian cities or African cities. And um, yeah, that's true. Um, but um, I, I want to kind of play with that a little bit, because if we're looking here at Baghdad, this is both Baghdad, and we're looking here at, uh, an early 20th century subdivision, which is forming rectangular blocks, main streets, secondary streets, um, tertiary streets that are actually moving into some interior space here. And we compare that to the historic core dating back to the 15th century of the Common Era. What we find, in fact, if we were able to zoom in on this, is that we have a dendrit dendritic structure within that um, very dense area. Likewise, if we look at uh, Atlanta and downtown, uh, dating to about 1853 here. What we see is um, a series of rectangular blocks and some rotated blocks, the explanation for which we'll come to at the end. And here up in Midtown, what we see is a residential planned garden suburb from the turn of the century, uh, which also is a block structure, but the blocks are not rectangular. Uh, again, it's the block structure and the distance to intersection that becomes the critical device. Likewise, the historic core of Baghdad and the street pattern, scale is very different, but the street pattern that we see in a late 20th century suburb in metropolitan Atlanta is actually the same pattern. Fascinating. Dendritic pattern. So we end up then by looking at what cities have in common. So if we look at Assur here from about uh, 1200 uh, before the common era, and we compare that to one of the oldest cities in the world, at least as old as this, we see that it's a very different structure. This is a purely dendritic structure, and this is, in fact, originally a gridded structure, gridded blocks. If we look at the map of Philadelphia produced by 
uh, Surveyor General home for the founder, William Penn, uh, in the uh, last quarter of the 17th century, what we see, in fact, again, boundaries, there are the lots, public spaces, Rittenhouse Square that we see here, streets, and so forth. Um, and that this structure is more similar to Damascus than Damascus is to Assur, and that Assur is more similar to the Windward subdivision than, in fact, it is to Philadelphia, right? So these are not purely cultural. They are, in fact, correlative more to time when they were built. Um, the significance of that is, frankly, escapes me exactly, but we'll, we'll try to tease that out over the course of the semester. So now, origins of the city. I think as human beings, we're interested in where we came from. You know, um, I think, again, this can be slightly deceptive as to having any real significance, but it is, it is a pretty fundamental question. There are myths of origin. Every culture, every civilization had them, had one. Um, and um, in, in 1650, uh, the Common Era, the Archbishop of Armagh, Brett, um, named James Usher, calculated that the earth began uh, in 4004 BC. That was it. Uh, he did that using the evidence that he had, which was sort of going back in the biblical text to try to determine exactly when the Bible would say the earth began. Um, the master at um, Cambridge University named Dr. John Lightfoot thought that he was wrong, and so he began his study, and he concluded, in fact, that he was right, that it was, the earth began in 4004 B.C., but further, it began on the 23rd of October at 9 a.m. in the morning. I'm not making this up, okay? Um, now, Aristotle, much earlier, had calculated the Earth, as, and Epicurus as well, as being much, much, much older. Um, and uh, there was a Chinese mathematician in the 18th century, A. Singh, who, um, who actually had calculated that the Earth was hundreds of millions of years old. Um, the question, the reason I raise this is, even if we knew exactly when cities began, or when the Earth began, or when anything else began, what would we do with that information? How would we apply it? What good would it do us? Right? And you, you can't really answer that question unless you believe that there is some completely divine type of city, ba-boom, and that's it, and we should try to vary from that as little as possible as the Romans believed. Um, it doesn't seem to matter um, when they began. Nonetheless, the fact that we are human beings and we're talking here in a course about cities, uh, it seems to me worth uh, sort of talking about that, if only briefly. Um, I took a lot of slides out of here because this lecture was too long. But, um, so let me say that one of the pieces of evidence that we have today that uh, Dr. John Lightfoot and the, bishop, the Archbishop of Armagh did not have 1650, is that uh, we have the mapping of the human genome. And this is um, really, I think, a revolution in understanding our past and our origins. Um, and some pretty astounding things have come from that uh, that have sort of turned uh, conventional, all the conventional understanding of human origins kind of on their head. It appears right now by tracking mitochondrial DNA that everyone in this room is related. In fact, everyone on Earth is related. And we're all descended from a very small population of people who lived on the um, southeast coast of Africa around 135,000 years ago, possibly a population as small as 3,500 people. But these people, unlike their close relatives, uh, apparently developed um, an, an extensive ability to modify their environment to suit them. And then for unknown reasons, there appears to have been a very rapid migration, two waves of rapid migration out of Africa following the coast up into what is now the Yemen and the Arabian Peninsula and on around into India. Others went up the river valley into Egypt, the second one, and then across uh, following the coastline up into Turkey 
Central Asia, and so on. Very, very, very long time ago. Um, now, some of the funny things that sort of appear with this mapping of the human genome, and this makes me laugh, is the notion that I am 4% Neanderthal. <laughs> that actually, if you are of European or Asian descent, you are probably carrying up to 4% Neanderthal genes in you, right? That's uh, hilarious to me. I don't know why I think that's funny, but I really do think that's funny. Because I'm old enough to remember sort of cavemen when I was in grammar school, you know, and sort of think I'm related to these people, you know, somehow. But, um, but the other uh, astonishing thing that is, I think, even more significant, far more significant, is that the people who live today on the east coast of Africa are more closely related to people living in Indonesia than they are to people living on the west coast of Africa. Right? What does that tell you? that it's easier to get around in the ancient world on water than it is on land, right? And that will become important in the diffusion of cities. Now, whoever these people were, and we don't know when, we don't know who they were, we don't know what kind of language they spoke, we don't know their ethnicity, we don't know anything. But the group of people who settled in this region that we see here had an advantage that no one else had. Uh, the clue is on the screen. Can anybody guess what it was? Well, they had rivers. Yes, that's very important. Right. But what was the other advantage? It's on the screen. Huh? Domestic animals. Domestic animals. Or I should say it's the indigenous home of four critical animals that are domesticable. Right? Goats, sheep, horses, and cattle. Cattle are indigenous originally to the Indus Valley. Horses originally were from North America. They were about the size of a dog. They died out. Somehow they got across into Asia. And once they hit the steppes of Central Asia, southern Russia, they had these open prairies and grasslands, and um, they started to grow big. Well, if you had a goat, you had an advantage, right? A real advantage. Now, there are domesticable animals elsewhere. You can domesticate an elephant, right? But what is the sexual maturity of an elephant? 15 to 18 years. So if your lifespan is 30 years, right, an elephant has one other elephant. And then you've got to wait another 15, 18 years, right, to have another one. Goats are sexually mature at six months. So in one year, two goats can become six goats, can become 12 goats, can become 18 goats, and within about three years, you have a whole flock of goats. And what do you do with goats? You can eat them. <laughs> you can milk them. You can make cheese from them. You can make leather from them. You can get their skins, right? You can do all kinds of things with goats. And what is the other great thing goats do? They eat your garbage, all right? Not a bad thing to have around goats. You could even make, I would make, you know, you could make the argument that goats are the basis of civilization. I don't know, but I, I sort of like that slightly tongue-in-cheek. Well, if you had goats, and they're very close relative sheep, and if you had a horse, I mean, you can domesticate a turkey, but you can't hook a plow up to it, right? You can domesticate a chicken, but you can't make shoes out of it. You follow me? You don't get milk from it. You don't get cheese from it. So you get eggs. That's a pretty good thing to have. But, um, but so these people had a great advantage. You said it earlier. They had rivers. But what else is on this map that's pretty clear? Lots of water. Lots of water. So once you are in a place like, let's say, here, and you actually are close to this, close to this river, close to that river, the Persian Gulf, Caspian Sea, so forth, it is easier for things to diffuse in the east-west than it is north-south. In fact, there's no evidence that the Incan civilization in Peru even knew that the Mayan civilization existed and vice versa because it had to pass through a tropical zone. So it's very difficult for food and for other things to move north-south because you're moving through um, different climatic zones where it's much easier to move east-west. And once it hits the Mediterranean, I should also mention that of the 32 edible grains in the world today, uh, 28 of them are indigenous to this part of the world. So let's just say these people got really lucky. <laughs> okay? And so it isn't surprising that if we 
present knowledge, we may find older things in Africa, we may find older things in Asia, we may even find something in North or South America. I doubt it, but we might. But as, we, as of today, the oldest known permanent human settlement on Earth was in southeastern Turkey, north, right, close to Syria, where a lot of fighting is going on in the Kurdistan region here of Iraq, uh, at a place called Gobekli Tepe. And it goes back 13,000 years before the present, right at the end of the recession of the last ice age. And it was a religious shrine. There were several of these built. No evidence, like Stonehenge that I mentioned, no evidence of a permanent settlement. Um, only that people would gather there actually for apparently religious purposes. There are these round uh, monolith stones that are created in a circle. They have all sorts of beautiful carvings on them in bas-relief of serpents and scorpions and all kinds of things. And um, we don't know who these people were. Obviously, no written language. All we have are these stones. Um, discovered about 15, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, they go back uh, a long, long way. Likewise, uh, next is Jericho, a city that... Um, uh, is an oasis, a naturally occurring oasis uh, on the Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea. Uh, and the third, uh, which is in your textbook, Chatal uh, Huyuk, also in Turkey. And um, there is some question as to whether or not these were cities. We know this was not. There's debate about whether these were. Uh, so let's take a look at those. And then later, for sure, the red dots are cities, by my definition. All right? In Egypt, at Ur and Uruk, in the Mesopotamian Delta, and then Hattusas, also in Turkey. So if we look at Jericho, uh, there are successive levels of occupation. The first is what's called the Natufian Proto-Neolithic period. You don't need to remember all of this other than, I might ask on a test, Jericho was occupied a bit by the Natufians. Um, was it a city or something, right? Um, and then all of this sort of pre-pottery and everything from what they was excavated by Kathleen Kenyon uh, right after World War II, the British archaeologist. And I was there doing some work um, for the Aga Khan a number of years ago, 1983, and I took a trip there to see what I could find. And basically, it looks like this. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's not, it doesn't do you much good. Um, but there's evidence of continuous occupation at Jericho, except for about a two to three hundred year period when it appears to have been abandoned. And it's what's called a tell, which is a sort of a, an, an artificial mound that rises above the floodplain of the Jordan River. Um, these um, artifacts, again, this memorial function that we see here with human skulls that actually have various kinds of um, stones set in the eyes that appear to have been ceremonially associated with some form of worship. Here's the mound of ancient Jericho. This is the modern city that we see today. The Jordan Valley is up there. And the only thing we have are these, um, these few walls and um, some steps and other things. There's not a whole lot going on there other than these burials. So Jericho isn't going to tell us much. However, Chatal Huyuk, um, which has been continuously excavated now for about the past three decades, in Turkey, uh, very old, not as old as Jericho, but very old, uh, we know a lot more about. Now, when you look at this archaeological map that we see here of houses, what do the black lines look like? Streets? They're not streets. They're party walls. In fact, you entered the house through the roof. They had no streets, right? And... Um, even more peculiar, they buried their dead under their floors, which is a very strange thing. I, you don't see that very much in the ancient world. So this is Chatal Huyuk. They appear to have controlled a material uh, obsidian, a black volcanic naturally occurring glass that was easily worked into sharp cutting instruments, and thus they controlled this material and they could create trade. Um, but again, we don't know what language they spoke. We don't know anything about them. We only know this. And there's one 
of an ancestor buried under the floor of the house. So no streets. So is it a city? Not by my definition. It had no streets. Uh, did it have a memorial function? Yes, but it was entirely in, uh, embedded within the dwelling itself. And we see this rather fanciful reconstruction. There's our sheep and our goats. Um, where people are up on the roof, and this is actually the access down into uh, the dwelling itself. So is this a permanent human settlement? Yes, absolutely. Is it a proto-city? Yes, I think we can call that. It is, is it a city in the way that we are talking about cities here? The answer is no. Now, Kostov also mentioned, and I've just mentioned trade, but also the development of writing. They appear to go hand in hand. If you are trading with people, you need to have to have some medium of exchange. You have to keep records of things. You record it. You write it down. The king owns this many sheep. So-and-so so owns that many. And um, if we go all the way back here to sort of the time of, of um, Jericho uh, and move it forward, we see that writing comes in independently sometime around uh, 6,000 years before the present. And um, they, it occurs um, independently and simultaneously in the Mediterranean world, in Egypt, um, in um, Mesopotamia, as well as in China. Now, writing, I would argue, the impulse to record is, is human, very human, and very old. It goes back, actually, perhaps to these kinds of things that we see here, the recording of a hunt, um, the exploits of a group of people, something, and then we see here this little girl saying, I will not write on the walls. She's actually saying, I will write on the walls. And if we go back and look at Egyptian architecture or Greek architecture, what we see, of course, is lots of writing all over walls, right? Sort of, um, again, part of that memorial function. Trade. Well, as trade developed, I'll have to tell you a true story. I was in Korea about uh, 10 years ago, or less, maybe eight years ago, and um, I was giving a talk there, and I was, they very gracious people, they asked me if I wanted to go see these tombs from the Scylla dynasty, it's about 600 AD. I said, yes, and I'm in these tombs, and I look, and I said, that looks like Roman glass, and the woman said, that's very good. Um, how did you know that? And I said, well, I, Rome, I know a good bit about Rome, and it just looked like Roman glass to me. She said, yeah, isn't that something? It was in the tomb. So what that means is, is that people were trading as far as the Korean Peninsula with the Roman world um, at least at 600 A.D., 600 of the Common Era. The sort of centers of trade appear as these sort of um, circles and lines that we show here. And then eventually moving much closer in time to the present, we have um, two main language groups that begin to develop, the Semitic-speaking people and the Indo-European-speaking people, from Sanskrit that we see here all the way up to English, which is an Indo-European language, as is Greek and Latin, Arabic being a Semitic language and so forth. And these groups, guess where they butted up against one another in this very area, this very old part of the world, that we see here. This is a Semitic speaking part. There are even some languages like Assyrian, which are agglutinative, kind of hybrids between the two. Aramaic was a kind of hybrid between the two. The Indo Europeans here on the north, and then trade. And all the action is in the sort of lavender areas that we see in between. Again, along rivers, along coastlines, so on and so forth. Central to this and the development of, of alphabetic writing as opposed to hieroglyphs or symbolic writing um, is, um, is actually the Phoenicians. In fact, we have a word that uh, we use it all the time, right? Phonetics, right? It goes back to Phoenicia, right? It's where it comes from. The Phoenicians were central to this trade. They lived in what is now Lebanon, the area of the eastern Mediterranean called the Levant. And they founded a city in Africa called Carthage. And they were dealing with both Indo-European and Semitic-speaking people in all these different languages, so they tried to develop a phonetic 
uh, sim symbology so that they could communicate. You could communicate to different groups. And so, you know, alpha, beta, you know, um, A, B, et cetera, became actually, fr came from the Phoenicians. And um, we have in the Semitic world, Aleph, Bet, in, in, in the Indo-European, alpha, beta. They're obviously coming from the same place, which is Phoenicia. And just, uh, you might find this interesting, we won't dwell on it today, but uh, you have different, completely different words for father, like ab, apt, abba, in Indo-European, pater, pita, pedar, mother, mater, matar, um, ima, etc. right? Totally different sounds that are arising for very common words that any group of people anywhere would have. A word for sky, a word for tree, a word for father, a word for mother. We'll just leave that and go on and look very quickly here at Mesopotamian cities. As the ice receded, um, the flat, broad areas of um, the Euphrates and Tigris Valley became what's called a braided delta, braided, because it was flat, the rivers are doing this, as opposed to being in a channel, right? So these braided deltas in the center of these were these hummocks or high ground, uh, and it appears that this is in fact where uh, cities in Mesopotamia were first built. One of the oldest, Ur, uh, that's it. That's the aerial photograph of Ur, and interestingly enough, the river of course has shifted, but you can still see the outline of the wall, the outline of the city here. And you can actually, as we'll see in a moment, the location of two harbors that were constructed here that allowed for river um, to dock the ships on the river. This is an overlay then of the uh, memorial or monumental uh, architectural pieces. These people were fantastic artists. And this is sort of a fanciful reconstruction of it um, today. Similar cities, sister city of Uruk. Again, the temple construction here that we see actually like an onion radiating out this concentric sort of um, walls of, of, of significance. Larsa, another one. And then this one, which we saw a moment ago with its um, Asur, uh, showing this dendritic structure that we see here. This was excavated by German archaeologists, so they have names like Winkelgasse Strait, so, you know, stuff like that. Um, the, I can tell you it wasn't called Winkelstrasse Street or something in, you know, Winkelstrasse in 3000 BC. Um, or this, again, which is the residential portion of Ur, which we can actually map land use on. The numbers that you see here are the, uh, is the distance, the number of rooms that you have to go through in order to get to the back part of the house. So these are party walls that we see here with an entrance here off this cul-de-sac. Most likely, we don't know, it was probably organized tribally, and so we end up here with um, probably what amounts to an extended family. We do have some street front retail. We have the square of the bakers. We even have a school, and at this important intersection, we have a small shrine or temple, um, just like we would have in a modern or contemporary city, okay? Now, this is a much later medieval city in Iran that uh, was frozen because of a terrible earthquake. But if we compare this to this, um, what we see is a, a sort of similar thing. What we have is a circuit wall around the whole thing. Then we have a citadel that we see here. We have a religious structure that we see here, a uh, sort of monumental structure. We have a secondary city here, which was probably associated with these two things, and then the normal population, which is living here. It becomes sort of useful, I think, to just look at that because we can then sort of imagine better what these things might have looked like, even though Iran is Indo-European speaking and Mesopotamia was Semitic. In the last two minutes, uh, Egypt is very different. Egypt, also a great river civilization, but here the Nile is in a very, very defined channel. And um, so surrounded on either side by desert, no need for defensive walls. And, of course, the entire life of, um, of these people depended upon the Nile. All of their myths of origin and so forth were associated with the Nile. They were completely and utterly uh, dependent upon it. 
If we go to El Amarna, which is, um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of um, ruins of Egyptian cities left. There are some monumental complexes, quite a few, very famous, but we don't have much of the cities because they're covered up. They're covered up by the sands and so forth. Um, I, I, I want to go through this because I want to make one quick point. Uh, Mark Lerner um, wrote an article not long ago that um, sort of overturned the conventional understanding of um, Egyptian civilization where there was a slave society and so on, they built the pyramids, saying, that, no, looking at the diet of these people, right, in the garbage pits, these were not slaves. These were people who lived fairly well. And uh, they probably were hired, hired artisans, hired craftsmen, so on and so forth. And um, he makes the statement that I like. He says, the pyramids built Egypt. Egypt did not build the pyramids. Now, what does he mean by that? I'll say that again when we get to Florence, that the Duomo built the Renaissance. The Renaissance did not build the Duomo, right? Because once you have organized yourselves, once you have labor, once you've stratified the society in skilled labor, um, organized material, organized men, organized everything to do this, what do you do for a second act? You don't just do it once, right? And so what he means literally is that the act of building these great monumental structures then led to other, the continued construction of more and more and more and more, and that Egyptian, ancient Egyptian civilization was really developed from that organization. Um, I think that's true. Now, uh, we're out of time, so we will come back and look in some detail at the Egyptian cities because they are the polar opposite of the Mesopotamian cities. Okay? Any questions?